why should you listen? Why should you give me half an hour of your time? Uh, because, frankly, um, an expert, apparently that's what I am, uh, is anybody who is more than 50 miles from home and has no responsibility for implementing the advice he gives and shows a lot of slides. <laughs> and that's me, right? So, but I'm going to tell you a little about what's happening in the UK right now, and hopefully that will inspire you. Because the UK is widely recognised now as a leader in this space uh, internationally, but we weren't always in that space. And over the last 20 years, social enterprise has really become a mainstream phenomena. And I'm going to tell you how and why that's happened. But before I do, I'm also a practitioner. I know I'm in a suit today. I'm much more comfortable uh, in the jeans and the flip-flops when they said you're going to come to Jamaica. That's what I imagined. Flip-flops and shorts and a rum punch. Uh, little did I know that you were going to have me in a suit and boots uh, while it's beautiful and sunny outside. So before I started at Social Enterprise UK, I ran a social enterprise. Now, has anyone heard of Kent, the county of Kent in England? It's known as the Garden of England. You might imagine it's like that. But ladies and gentlemen, it's not. Unfortunately, it's a bit more like that. Well, at least my community was. Uh, lots and lots of kind of inner urban deprivation and decay. Uh, an area of the UK that had previously had a really, really successful shipbuilding industry. Uh, the Royal Dockyards, fine buildings. And then when shipbuilding closed, the community very, very quickly uh, kind of unraveled. They weren't the jobs. 30,000 skilled jobs were lost. Mainly, they were jobs for men. They were highly paid, highly skilled jobs. And they went. And what was left behind was this kind of awful situation of mass deprivation and poverty. Uh, and I saw uh, a building. This was a younger me. Uh, it's always good in your biogs to use a younger picture, I find. Um, I've seen uh, some of our speakers have also opted to do that. Claire? Uh, anyway. Uh, what was I going to say? I found this old building, right, in my, in my community, and it, this is what it looked like. Uh, full of pigeons, rats, uh, vandals, graffiti artists. And with the community, because I don't believe any social entrepreneur really achieves anything without the support of his or her community, uh, we transformed this building. I'm going to be quite quick. Uh, this is what we turned it into. It wasn't easy. Uh, some people say... <laughs> thank you very much. Some people say that there is no place for grant funding in social enterprise. And I fundamentally disagree. All sorts of businesses need a helping hand to get off the ground. And I was very, very fortunate that at the time, uh, Britain wasn't in an economic recession. There was lottery money around. And I managed to get about a million pounds together to, to buy the building and to refurbish it with the support of many, many other local community members. And this is what we, we did. Now, inside, we tried to create a hub and a space that people felt proud to go to. I hate this notion that poor people have to go to crap buildings to access services. Where's the pride and the dignity in that? You start by treating people as if they are valued as they rightly deserve to be. So we tried to create, a bit like Claire's Place, which is absolutely beautiful and fantastic, somewhere where people felt proud to go to. The first thing you want to do is get people to come in and use services. And the best way to do that is by giving them a good experience. So this is what we try to do. I'm going to be quick. I also set up a radio station. This is called Radio Sunlight. And I'm delighted to have met the Alpha Boys. I'm going to be tuning into their radio station, be one of their 85,000 listeners. Uh, but I set this one up in Gillingham, Kent. Giving people a voice is also part of the, the process of transference of power. Giving people an opportunity to speak up and be independently powerful, their own advocates, not relying on other people to speak up for them. And a radio station, a social enterprise radio station, can be a really powerful tool for empowering people, giving them the opportunity to express how they feel and what their aspirations and ambitions are in life. And a recording studio. You're not the only island that likes a bit of music. Uh, my, my, my community also had lots and lots of talents and skills. And so a recording studio, but not some sort of you know, cheap, egg box on the walls kind of recording studio. Something that could actually be hired out at commercial rates, generate an income, that would then give us the profit that we could uh, use to employ people, to train and skill up local people. And then, excuse the baby, it's not mine. Uh, it looks a bit surprised to see me. Um, the baby uh, is there as part of a breastfeeding group in one of our cafes. We started with one and we grew to five cafes over a period of, I don't know, four or five years. Uh, not all of them were successful. And one thing in social enterprise you need to learn is that, in, like in business, you know, failure is part of the process. You're not Midas. Not, not, not that everything you touch is, is going to turn to gold. I had one cafe, right? It's difficult to sell fair trade, organic, sustainably developed coffee served by people from difficult backgrounds, all for about a quid. 
Um, I mean, basically, the economics don't work. If they did work, Starbucks would have been there before me. Uh, and so, actually, what I did, I had one cafe, and I thought, this isn't working. I'm losing a bit of money here. I know, I'm going to open four more cafes. Um, and I thought that something called economies of scale would help me achieve sustainability, but it didn't. All it did was allow me to kind of multiply my failures. And it almost risked my entire organization. And failure, you learn as much from failure as you do from success. And every entrepreneur, every social entrepreneur will have scars uh, on their hearts uh, and on their arms and on their heads and all over their bodies because this is not easy. And anyone tells you that this is easy is a fool because this is tough, but it's worth it. It's the most enlightening, most uh, in incredible experience that I've personally ever been on in my life. So what can governments do to support social enterprise? Well, first of all, they don't know what they need to do, so you need to tell them. You need to work out exactly what you want them to do, and you need to tell them. And in the UK, with Claire's support and with our members, what we've done is every general election built a manifesto telling them what we want them to do. And that's really, really important. And as a consequence, we've got manifesto uh, ideas into all of their uh, prospectuses as they face a general election. So getting that political buy-in. The Greens love us because this is about sustainability. Labour love us because this is about, you know, kind of tackling inequality. Uh, the Liberal Democrats love us because, hey, they're the Liberal Democrats. And the Conservatives love us because, fundamentally, this is a market-based solution. Uh, so you can sell this into any political party. You don't have to align to any kind of political philosophy. This is good for society, this is good for people, this is good for the planet, and you can sell these ideas into politicians wherever they may come from. So in the UK, this is like, you know, a, 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 you can have these slides as well, but these are some of the things that we've seen. It's not always about law, it's not always about policy, sometimes it's about leadership. So having the minister here today, Anthony Hilton, was incredibly important for him to make a commitment to you that this is uh, a watershed in the growth of this movement. You need to build that engagement with him, continue that engagement, even if it's building awareness on the television, the radio, in speeches, that will help, help build the momentum. And certainly when Tony Blair was Prime Minister in 1997, in his first speech he talked about the importance of social entrepreneurship and it helped elevate the sector. It helped make private sector businesses and academics and all sorts of other people more interested in it. There's an endowment called Unlimited, which gives small grants to social entrepreneurs uh, uh, specifically, uh, and that, that has so far supported about 6,000. The key thing, and Claire again mentioned this, the Social Enterprise Unit as part of the DTI being established in 2001. And yes, we want to be in the Department of Business, because the Department of Business tends to be massive, because all governments want to see economic development happen. And actually, that's where the conversation and where lots of the power lies. So you could be in the department of charities and, and do-gooding, uh, but actually you really need to be in the big conversations where the big money sits, where the big power sits, and often that will be your department of business. And it is a business. We are a business community. We're just a modern, forward-thinking type of business that's fit for the modern needs of any society. Uh, you need to get together. You know, you need events like this. Congratulations to JN Foundation for bringing this together. You need these events. Yes, well done. Louder! <laughs> so, you need, you need networks. You need to feed off each other. You need to intertrade. You need to buy and sell. You need to share ideas. You need to share buildings, IP. Uh, you need to form these relationships amongst yourselves because together you are stronger. Uh, and so, forming the Social Enterprise Coalition in 2002, which is now 2000 UK, was a critical point in terms of galvanizing the lobby that can influence big business, that can you know, kind of influence the politicians that can bring the whole thing together. As a consequence, we got a new legal model for social enterprise established in 2005. We've got new investment funds, uh, new opportunities. People working in the public sector now can say, you know what, working for government's all right, but it's a bit bureaucratic. Uh, I don't really have much fun working in government. What I want to do is break my team off. I'm going to break my department off from government, whether it's in health, whatever it might be in, and become a social enterprise and become a contractor to government rather than an employee of government. And so far, we've seen uh, thereabouts uh, about 200,000 ex-government workers leave their government, the security of their government jobs, to go and establish social enterprises and deliver back to government on the basis that that will liberate them. They can be entrepreneurial. They can do what's right, not just what they're told to do. Uh, and they are liberated from the bureaucracy of government. 
So we've seen a whole range. One in six is the government's aspiration. One in six civil servants will end up working in the social enterprise space. You also, um, we've also seen the launch of big society capital. In England, we had something called dormant bank accounts. So bank accounts that hadn't been touched for 30 years. So if a bank account hadn't been touched for 30 years, there was an act of law passed that said that we could take that money. If they ever came and said, oh, you've taken my money, we'd give it back. But fundamentally, if it wasn't being used, rather than the banks generating interest off of that money, we thought we'd put it to social good. So we've taken 400 million pounds out of dormant bank accounts, bank accounts that haven't been used for 30 years, and created big society capital. And that is a loan fund to invest into social enterprises to really, really give them the access to capital that they couldn't otherwise get. And capital is important. Economics is important. Cash is important. And so getting that cash to invest, to buy a building, to buy a new piece of machinery, to open up another shop is necessary. Um, and actually, you can always find new ways of looking at, at how government allocates money and how it can create the revenues to support the growth of this sector. And this is being replicated in all sorts of different countries around the world. The Social Value Act was also mentioned by Safri this morning. Um, the, the Social Value Act has put uh, a, a condition on all government spending, that they have to show that they have considered the social benefits of their purchases. And of course, that isn't social enterprise specifically. What it does, it moves all businesses into this space. All businesses now have to prove that they are creating social benefit within their societies where they are making money. And that's got to be a good thing, right? This isn't just about social enterprises taking over the world. This is about convincing all businesses that doing the right thing is commercially in their interests. So we've seen some really, really important initiatives take place. And this is all part of an ecosystem. It doesn't happen overnight, but once you start building that momentum, you never look back. And you start creating a whole slug of the economy that is focused on doing what's right for humanity and what's right for the planet. More recently, the European Commission have started waking up to this. Uh, they now have something called the Social Business Initiative. Um, and it's a top EC priority for the next seven years now. Um, and their procurement directives, which often strangle businesses in Europe from doing the right thing, because traditionally it's always been focused on the cheapest, you must buy the cheapest, you must buy the cheapest. Uh, well, now Europe has actually shifted its procurement directives to say you can buy on the basis of social value too. Last year we had the social investment tax relief. So if you've got a high net worth individual or anyone with a bit of cash, you don't even have to have a huge amount and you invest in a social business, you get 30% of your tax back on it. And that's incentivizing ordinary people and wealthy people to start putting money into these types of businesses. Simple things that don't really cost the government any money at all. What can governments do? Well, they can raise awareness by talking it up, saying to businesses, we want you to be involved in this sector. We want you to buy from social enterprises. They can talk about the importance of social entrepreneurship. They can encourage universities to develop master's courses, uh, basic foundation learning opportunities, all sorts of opportunities, peer-to-peer, -peer, the School for Social Entrepreneurs. Those sorts of uh, initiatives can be supported by government directly. Um, they can develop the policies that actually reward sustainable thinking in education, finance, procurement, economic development. As someone had said, you know, this isn't one department's responsibility. This goes right across the piece. Every government department can have a, a, a role to play in building this movement. And what can business do to support social enterprise? Well, bizarrely, it's really interesting. Some of them are doing interesting stuff. I'm not a big fan of Coca-Cola. You're probably at this point asking, who is he a fan of? Um, I'm not a fan of anyone or anything, apart from social enterprise. I love social enterprise. Anyway, here's Coca-Cola. And what Coca-Cola, do, uh, and particularly in parts of the developing world, is they have a distribution network that the, U the UN could only dream of. You can go to the farthest flung, remotest part of Africa where you can't find, you know, a, you know, you can't find a doctor, but you can buy a bottle of Coke. So actually using their distribution network to, to take medicines and mosquito nets and malaria solutions out has been a really, really great social enterprise. So the social enterprise built these kits that just fit in the void of the crates. So there's no extra cost to Coca-Cola in taking the medicines and the provisions out through their distribution network out to these places. And it's transformative. You are taking medicines and, and equipment out to the furthest reaches uh, of some of the hardest places to get to in Africa, and you are saving thousands and thousands and thousands of lives. Um, players already touched on Brigade. This is PwC. Uh, this is their building. This is my office. This is the restaurant on the ground floor. I'll buy you lunch if you're ever in London. Um, and our chefs here are all ex-homeless, and they go on to work in the Savoy. And PwC have aided and supported and invested in this. 
Danone, uh, the yogurt people, there's Mohammed Yunus, our friend. Uh, he got together with Danone, the yogurt people, in Bangladesh and got a highly nutritious yogurt. This is the yogurt here. Uh, it's sold for a very, very low cost. And what's different about this yogurt is that it has your complete nutritional requirements. Um, so actually, you can tackle uh, malnutrition very, very easily by selling these very, very low cost yogurts. And there's a network of uh, you know, community uh, entrepreneurs selling these yogurts at very low, low prices. Um, all sorts of people using their skills to help these social enterprises grow. Businesses, big businesses, know what they're doing. That's why they're successful. They have a huge amount of talent that's available that you can draw upon uh, to help get your business plans, to get your marketing right, to get your products right. You know, build those relationships. Don't always ask them for cash. You know, they have other assets that you can utilize. And I'm sure the JN Foundation and, and the, 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 the Building Society is just in a perfect place to provide some of those skills and support. Uh, Wait is a construction company. Every time they win a contract, they guarantee that they will take on a new social enterprise supply into their supply chain. And you can see big businesses getting alert to this. You know, Paul Walsh, Diageo, which is a big drinks company, is basically saying, if we don't do this, then we know the game's up for our business. Paul Polman, Unilever, one of the world's biggest companies, saying that any business that doesn't start recognizing our responsibilities to people and the planet are going to be rejected, not only by our customers, but also by our staff. What can you do to support social enterprise? Well, you can start a social enterprise. If you're a charity, start, start being a bit more entrepreneurial. Start thinking about what skills you have within your community that you can utilize to actually start trading. Buy social yourselves. You know, there are a hundred options out there. By making a simple transaction, you can transform someone else's life. You can if you don't want to set up a social enterprise, you can work for one. You have choices. And this isn't like, you know, you're not going to you know, be destitute forever if you work for a social enterprise. These are businesses. They pay well. You can invest in a social enterprise, and you can campaign for it. And we're seeing this revolution of community-owned shops, pubs, libraries, wind farms, whole islands. Jamaica could become a social enterprise island. This is uh, the island of Gia in Scotland. And the island of Gia in Scotland used to be owned by uh, an American uh, very, very rich man. And the community bought him out and have turned the island into a social enterprise island. So there is this revolution taking place. Pubs, post offices, all sorts of stuff. And up here, the phone is the world's first social enterprise smartphone. So you can forget up with your ambitions and aspirations to own an Apple iPhone 6. Go for the fair phone instead. Conflict-free titanium and parts. Fair labor. You know, mobile phones have a huge impact, negative impact on the world. The idea that you can have an ethical social enterprise smartphone, it's now become a reality. Um, and buy social. Do a great deal. Um, I've now got a little video. Sion's going to just play it for you. I'm going to sum up here. Uh, but this is a little animation which I hope leaves you inspired to start thinking about the difference that you can make in the world just by buying social. Well, it's Prices of businesses that reinvest their profits. They put people and planet first. From caring for children in developing countries to supporting the communities we're part of. Buying from social enterprises takes your spending much further. What we buy can educate, nurture and empower, providing solutions to some of the world's greatest challenges. Whether it's reducing food waste, supplying clean, safe water, producing affordable green energy, or getting people back into employment. At work or at play, there is a social enterprise for just about everything. There are more than 70,000 in the UK, led and supported by inspiring people all over the country, including some familiar faces. Join the revolution. Buy social and unleash your spending power.